Hello, welcome to another episode of Mantis Hacks. If you're not sure what Mantis is, uh, check out the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Mantis Robot, or take a look at the rest of the YouTube channel. In this week's episode, I am going to be installing the hydraulic hoses on the uh, gripper module here. I'll also go on to look at some electronics and uh, talking about how to read the encoders to close the loop on the whole system and get this working in um, servo control mode. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but first of all, so this hose assemblies, which I've had made now, are ready to be fitted. And what, I've, what I'm going to do is, um, on the end of the hose assemblies, come back to this point here. So this is the mounting point that goes onto the mantis here. And this is the front of the, the uh, tilt and pitch unit. And uh, so basically, to get this on and off fast, if I need to, so it can change over tooling, I'm putting these quick release couplings on the hydraulics. So these are called flat face couplings. And these are quarter inch BSP flat face couplings. And there'll be six of them down here in pairs, so to three pairs, six couplings. And that will go to my three actuators on the, the front unit here. Um, basically these couplings are kind of quite nice because it's a very fast way to uh, recouple hydraulics, but also they're flat face so you can keep them clean because it's imperative to keep the hydraulic oil clean, especially in uh, a closed loop system where I'm using some really um, high end servo valves which need like 10 to 20 micron filtration. I've actually had all the hoses made up already and what I do to get my hose length correct is I buy a, a cheap bit of fuel hose like this, this is a quarter inch uh, fuel line for cars and what have you, uh, and I buy some tail fittings, the same as I might use in the hydraulics, so maybe a banjo fitting and here's a right angled fitting just pushed in the end there. And then basically I just put the hose where it would attach to the actuator that I want to do, route it around where I think it might want to go and then take it up to its end point and basically take a measurement and that's it. Um, I mean you do need to bear in mind that uh, hydraulic hoses don't bend as much as this and there is a minimum bend radius um, for hydraulic hoses which will be on their specification sheet um, but I'm using quarter inch hose which is fairly flexible for hydraulics uh, so it's not too bad so I've already measured all these hydraulic hoses up hopefully I've got it right um, so I'm going to try and fit those now to the gripper the rotary axis and the pitch axis here and then I'll come back and talk about the encoder and the closed loop feedback stuff Okay, so I've flipped the mechanism over. Actually, I've just remembered that the rotary axis has these really short hoses uh, and it doesn't have banjos, it has these little um, 90 degree um, compact elbows and that's because it's got a, a special fitting in here. I can't think what it is, it might be an SAE fitting, but it's got a converter already um, pushed in here which is um, whatever the fitting in the axis is to quarter inch BSP so I had to go with these uh, little um, compact elbows to try and keep uh, minimize any damage that could be done under here basically um, so I just need to put the ends on uh, here the quick release couplings and then this one's uh, ready to be fitted I've got the pitch axis and the rotary axis uh, plumbed up now. The pitch axis disappeared down through this little uh, lightening hole on the top of the steel plate here, which is really handy because it keeps those cables together. I will have to deburr the edge of that just to make sure that they run smoothly through it. Um, I've still got the gripper to do, but I'm not going to attach the gripper onto the mechanism yet because it's going to become too uh, cumbersome to move around. Um, but I will put the new hoses on the gripper because then I'll have these flat face couplings on everything and it'll be, make it really easy to test each uh, actuator individually because I'll do the same on my C-top manifold which we talked about last week I'll put uh, quick face couplings on those flat face couplings and then I'll be able to plumb in each one um, when I want to test it well that's the old hoses out of the back of the gripper but um, when I took them out I noticed that one of them had been chafing on the edge of this um, entrance point here and it is quite a sharp edge piece of metal, laser cut metal there 
So I'm just going to power file that back a bit to um, smooth that edge off. This is all back together um, and pretty much ready just to give a quick test before I move on to the encoders that I mentioned earlier. Um, but before I do that I'll just explain some improvements I've made on the pump and to do that I'll take you in closer. Okay, so if you remember last week I was saying that the pump was running well, but um, I felt that it was running very noisily, and I think this was due to chattering of the pressure relief valve, the internal one built into the central manifold. Uh, and indeed I was correct in my assumption, uh, and that is normal behaviour, but uh, isn't terribly good. So what I've done is I've added this external pressure relief valve here, this is a little quarter inch unit, and uh, set the internal pressure relief valve to about 90 bar, and the external one to 70 bar, which is what this pump is currently rated at. So now the internal one isn't in use, um, and all the work's been done by the external one. And what we have here, the arrangement is the P port comes up into the relief valve here, and also out through the check valve, and to this quick release coupling. Uh, and then the return line coming back here, also through a quick release coupling, is going down through our filter and back into tank and also the pressure relief valve goes back through our filter and into tank. So there's two advantages. One is that it makes the pump much quieter and also any um, oil that's just circulating the system through the relief valve is also getting filtered. And ultimately, if I want to, I can add external cooling to this line here so the uh, all the flow goes through the cooler as well, which is a much better system. Right, now that I'm happy with the hydraulic system, the pump's working well, the manual control work valve is working great, the hoses are fitted, uh, it's time to move on to writing some code because now I need to think about closing the loop and installing proper servo valves. Uh, now I have a system on the Mantis that will already do that, but I thought it would be more fun to do a benchtop version using an Arduino. And uh, to start with, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, write the code to talk to the synchronous serial interface encoders, which, um, as you've already seen, I'm going to install these on all the axes on the grip ahead. So that's what's up next. Okay, so I've got my um, Arduino ready to go here, and I've taken the uh, data sheet online for the encoder, and there are 12, uh, sorry, 8 pins and an M12 connector on the encoder. So I've taken an M12 socket here with, with trailing leads and I've soldered them onto a pin header and plugged that into the green uh, breadboard here on top of my Arduino. There's an Arduino Uno, I think it's a clone. Um, and basically the, the pins I'm interested in are the power supply which can be between 4.5 and, and 30 volts. Uh, so I'll be running it off the 5 volt supply from the Arduino and the clock and data lines. So basically on a synchronous serial interface you control the clock to the encoder and you clock data out of the encoder. Uh, now the only other interesting thing about this is that the data lines are actually a differential pair uh, and that's for no noise immunity in harsh environment systems. So what I've done is put a MAX488 driver chip on here and the 488 driver has a, uh, a differential transmitter and a differential receiver built in. So I use the transmitter for the clock line and then data will come back in on the receiver. Now you don't have to use the differential bus. There are ways around it. So for the transmitting side, you can basically put uh, a potential divider, say two 10K resistors on the B line. Um, so across five volts and take the, the middle of the potential divider to the B line. And then you just toggle your A pin up and down that should work and then on the receiver side you just look at the A signal um, because that's just straight TTL so you don't have to do it but it's much better if you can do it and it's so simple to wire up a MAX488 then why not so let's start looking at some code okay so here's my sketch for the Arduino and on the right hand side here I've got my AF60B data sheet ready um, so at the top of my sketch I'm just defining the pins I'm going to be using, the LED on pin 13, I've got the clock and data of the encoder on pins 2 and 3. I then have the, some definitions here to define the type of encoder I've got, so it's a 15-bit encoder. Uh, and then there are three status bits, um, I've got a 1 microsecond delay for the clock rate of the encoder. 
and there are some other status bits to find here. Then my global variables, I have the encoder position and the encoder status. Uh, and then in my setup route here, routine, I've got um, the clock as an output, the data as an input, and the LED as an output. I then set the encoder clock to high, the idle state of the clock is high. Uh, and then set up my serial port here just for debug purposes. And then there's a 50 millisecond delay, and that comes from the encoder data sheet. And it says that the initialization time is 50 milliseconds after which point data is valid. Uh, I then move on to my loop here. So this is happening, the loop's happening every 20 milliseconds or more or less. Uh, that's about 50 hertz. I'm just toggling the LED on and off here so I can see the loop is running. And the first thing I do is I call this uh, routine called read encoder and I pass the clock and the data pins as into that routine. So let's go down and have a look at what that does. So here's my read encoder routine and this basically comes in with the clock and data pins and it starts a loop and the loop uh, is basically the amount of encoder bits which is 15 and the, the status bits which is 3 so the loop is going to happen 18 times and the first thing I do is I pull the clock low because the idle state for remember is uh, high so clock comes low and there's a delay of one microsecond then the clock goes high another delay of one microsecond and now we can read the data but the first thing we do is shift the data left by one um, but it starts off obviously at zero, so that really doesn't do anything the first time through the loop. Uh, we then take the read the data port and the data pin of the encoder, and that will be stuffed into the least significant bit of the data register. And then we go back around to our top of our loop and do the same thing again. Uh, and as you can see, as this keeps going around, the least significant bit, the least significant bit that gets read, uh, keeps getting shifted left, so it actually ends up being the most significant bit. And that is the way the encoder is read. So the most significant bit comes in first and you end up with the least significant bit last. So once we've got all 18 bits of data, we go back up to our loop here. And what we do, that's stored into this uh, local variable raw encoder. And the first thing I do is strip off the status data by anding raw encoder with seven. So that's three least significant bits. Uh, and then I'm going to get the position from the encoder. And to do that, I'm going to take my raw encoder and shift it right by three bits to get rid of those status bits now and end it with 7FFF, which is our 15 bits resolution. So that masks off just leaving the position data. Now I'm going to print that to the serial port so we can see it in our serial monitor. And I have my encoder here, uh, which is plugged into my Arduino. And the code is currently running on there, so I can uh, open up the serial monitor here. And we can see we've got some data there. So if I rotate the encoder, you can see that data changing. There's a couple of error signals popping up there, so I might uh, take a look at that in a minute. But uh, first of all, I just want to show you, close that down and show you the same thing with the serial plotter. So here we go, so here's our encoder position. Let's move it around. All right, so the data is kind of all over the show. It's not linear. And that is because the encoder is outputting gray code. Gray code is basically a form of coding uh, invented by Frank Gray. And there's lots of information on this on Wikipedia. And effectively what grey code does is it um, allows uh, an encoding system where only one bit changes with successive numbers. Uh, and it was primarily used in um, early switching encoders. So what we need to do is actually convert the data from the encoder from grey code to, to our linear code that we require. And that's what we'll look at doing next. Okay, so let's take a look at that conversion function. So here it is, the convert encoder gray code, uh, and it gets a value passed into it and returns a value. Um, and basically this uh, function is taken from online or the Wikipedia page um, on gray code. And it's a series of exclusive ors and shift writes by various amounts. 
Uh, I'm not going to go into explaining that. Um, there's plenty more of that on Wikipedia. So we return from that function so that I've put this into my loop up here. So I've added a new variable called gripper encoder gray code, which was the original uh, data. So that's just stripping off our status bits and masking. Uh, and then it gets called, sent into this function and gets converted and it should hopefully give us our actual position. So I'm just, uh, I've added to our output in the um, debug monitor here. So it now sends the gray code out followed by a space and then the gripper encoder position in linear format, hopefully. So let's take a look back on the serial monitor, on the plotter, sorry. Okay, there we go. So it's running, there's our encoder. So now we can see the blue line is the gray code and the orange line is the linear data. So as I rotate the code encoder, you can see there we're getting converted linear data out of it. Okay, so that's working really nicely. Um, we could leave it at that point. However, there's something else uh, I think it'd be good to show you, which is um, just checking the, I'm gonna put a, a logic analyzer on the clock and data pins and see the actual timing that's going on there. Because although within our loop down here, we've got our one microsecond delay, it doesn't really happen on uh, an Arduino because uh, the digital write, for example, is quite a long function and it takes much longer than one microsecond. Um, so it'd be interesting to see actually what kind of clock and data signals are happening here. And we could probably tighten all this up. And in fact, I'm going to write a faster version of the same function. So let's take a look at that. So I'm going to show you this um, logic device that I've hooked up to the Arduino here. It's, uh, it's an eight channel logic analyzer and um, I've got the clock and data pins hooked up and a ground signal attached here. Uh, just take a look at this actually. This is, um, so this is a device by a company called Salier. Um, I have no idea how to pronounce their name. I don't think they frankly care according to their forum posts, but don't let it detract from the device because they're amazing devices. and. Um, if you're doing anything uh, that uses protocols or clocks and data, things like I squared C, UART, these are really useful because um, when you hook it up to their software, uh, it actually does protocol analyzing. So it can tell you what's coming out of your serial port, for example, or your I squared C port. Really useful bits of kit. Um, so I've just hooked it up here to the clock and data pin on the uh, on the encoder, and uh, I can basically see now. Here's my clock at the top here and you can see the clock low time is 4.43 microseconds and the clock high time is 10.69 microseconds uh, which gives a frequency of 66.14 kilohertz which is way below its 2 megahertz uh, maximum uh, and the reason for that even though we're using one microsecond delays is because those digital read and write functions on the Arduino are pretty slow uh, so what I'm going to do now is uh, rewrite that function um, but uh, by uh, directly accessing the ports to set the pins. Uh, so I'll be able to speed all this up and get that clock looking much better. Right, here is the uh, faster version of my reading coder routine. It still uses a clock and data pin passed in. Uh, it still does the loop 18 times, but I've got rid of the digital write and digital read routines and replaced them with direct port access. Now this only works with port D at the moment, uh, but that's okay because my clock and data are on port D, they're pins two and three. Uh, and first of all, I take the clock low as before by writing to the port, and then do a delay of three microseconds currently, and then uh, take my clock high again, another delay of three microseconds. I shift the data, and then I read the port by using the port in D register. I shift its pin down and then I mask it with the least significant bit and store that in data and I go around my loop. Uh, now it's working pretty well. I've got the encoder here and it's currently running. So if I just, there we go, move that up and down, I'm getting nice, clean, smooth data, linear data out of that. I removed the grayscale from the graph just so we can see that easier. Um, so that's really nice. Uh, now there was a few, I was having some problems with some glitching on the encoder, some of the, on the data uh because i had these microsecond delays here down to about one or two uh, which should be well within the um, the specification of the encoder and if in fact if we look at the 
output on the logic analyzer. We can see right now I'm running at 197 kilohertz here, um, which is well within specification of the one megahertz uh, capability of the encoder. But then I realized that the um, driver chip I'm using is a MAX488 driver chip, and that is SLU rate limited to 250 kilohertz, and so I was overdriving the driver chip. I was pushing up to about three or 400 kilohertz, and that's when I started to get data problems out of the encoder. So I've dropped it back to 200 kilohertz, and everything's working great again. So that's it for this video. Um, next time I'm going to add some more hardware to the Arduino so that I can talk to these proportional servo valves. And then once the valves are in place and the encoders fitted to the gripper, we should be able to close the loop on the gripper and control it from a potentiometer or something else. Uh, in the meantime, uh, do leave any comments or feedback and uh, do like us on the Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash mantisrobot.